What's up, everybody? I am Johnny Christ, and this is Drinks with Johnny. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. I'm super jazzed. I got a couple of, of guys on, on the show today that I'm huge, uh, I'm an absolute huge fan of in uh, uh, Joey Cape and Marco DeSantis of the band Bad Astronaut. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good to be here. Good. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Uh, looks we, at, we cheers. wish we were with you at that bar. Yeah. <laughs> Next time for sure. What are you guys no, drinking on tonight? Marco? Well, Joey, I'll let you go first because you're drinking something much more interesting than me. Oh, I'm drinking an Aperol Spritz. Nice. Just barely got home in time from working to, to make this thing, but I don't know. I wasn't quite ready for like anything stiffer than that. Yeah. But it's, it uh, is a Monday night. Delicious. It is a Monday night too, so. Aperol, exactly. An Aperol Spritz is a lovely, that's a lovely uh, refreshment. Especially, you know, this time of the year. It's a lovely refreshment. I'm just yeah. drinking uh I'm just drinking lime and H2O because it's my annual um I go through this thing. I don't recommend it because it's really not that fun, but I do this <laughs> thing every year now for like the last five years where I do a hundred days of no drinking. Wow. And yeah. And then uh, then I'm free to drink as much as I want. But I just take a hundred days a year and it's always between it's right until my birthday, which will be May, next month, May third. And oh, happy birthday coming up. And I'll come home. You know, I don't yeah. usually do that, but I did it this year when I had COVID. Oh, shit. You had COVID. <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. So I was playing. Let's let's start off of with that there, Joey. Um, yeah, I was just uh, uh, yeah, hanging out with dry. Fat Mike a, a couple of weeks ago. We were uh, we were golfing, yeah. and he told me you got hit with it pretty, pretty fucking hard. We were having trouble singing and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, are you feeling better now? It was bad, man. It was really bad. I mean, I know some people, you know, my, my, my dad who I live with, uh, he, he's 82 and he had zero symptoms the whole time. Wow. My mom and I were just like dying, like for three weeks, two and a half weeks. And then I had really, I had long haul symptoms for another month or so. And I still have occasionally weird little bouts with long haul stuff, but it, I'm finally pretty much back to normal my brain's still a little funny like uh, you'll probably see at some point in this yeah but you can't dude, let me just cut in here you, you, don't let joey blame that part of uh, on COVID. his brain was funny before <laughs> no it's my COVID brain <laughs> oh poor it's joey like, like, poor like, joey <laughs> yeah like when you have a baby marco and you, you use your baby as an excuse to get out of parties and stuff. oh totally oh yeah totally it just becomes a catch-all you're like yeah you know covid you know, maybe. Isn't that a kid? Isn't yeah. your kid like seventeen? <laughs> I know, so you're still using yeah. it. I love that. Such a, that's that's, awesome. that's a great excuse. Anyway, yeah, it was a drag, and I'm glad it's over. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I didn't drink for almost like three months. I just a little while ago had my first couple of drinks, and it was just delightful. I went over to the. I have like one bubble house that I've had the whole time, mm -hmm. and uh, my mm -hmm. friends Donald and Sarah. And I went over there and it was so sweet. They had set up like a wet bar for me and they were like, so how you, what do you, would you like Mr. Cape for your first drink? Back? <laughs> and the drag of it was, man, I had like one drink and just started slurring my words. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It wasn't because I hadn't drank in three months. I've done that plenty of times. That was the COVID stuff. Okay. It was just like for a while I would have a drink and go, well, I guess I never get to drink again because I'm the, Oh God. Like I don't even feel buzzed. But yeah. my brain is going like, oh, and I'm like, I'm planning on driving home. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> no, like, that's gnarly. Yeah. So now I'm kind of back to normal and everything. That's Sorry. good. Did you lose your sense of smell and taste and stuff like that, Joey? No, I got a bunch of other mental oh. uh, blood membrane stuff. There was definitely some brain stuff. That's Lots so weird that, that, that I, happens for reason, different for everybody. Yeah. Like I couldn't sleep for a really long time hmm. until I figured out that my peanut pineal gland wasn't creating melatonin okay and melatonin's like you know okay. that's like the wimpy guy's like sleeping pill or something like it never worked at all for me on tour or anything so i was like that's weird but you need it you know and so i went and got some and i took one and i slept for like 20 hours and i was like Whoa. oh my god melatonin's Whoa. like over the counter i'm stoked like, <laughs> yeah i actually was happy about that because I, I always have a hard time sleeping you know uh-huh but there were all sorts of weird things. 
Yeah, it's so it's weird. It's not fun to talk about. No, I'm your, sure. Your viewers. Yeah, they're, they're like all they're like, so, they're like, I thought we were going to have this nice, it. peaceful, yeah, we're going to have this nice, peaceful uh, yeah. conversation. And it's yeah. bumming me out right at the top. No, I brought it up, though, because my wife did have yeah, COVID yeah. as well. Bad she was really sick. You know, one thing you can rely on, bad astronaut will reliably break your heart. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find a way. <laughs> well, let's get into some we'll more bad astronauts. dim the light. Yeah, let's get into some bad astronaut though, guys. Uh, you guys started this project uh, back in like early two thousands, right? How did that all come together? Because I know, I know you guys separately from your other bands, like Lagwagon. Uh, Joey is probably one of my, I mean, top five punk bands in my life, easily. Right. Sugar Cult's great band. You did a bunch of stuff with them. You did some great tours with Green Day and Blink One Eighty Two back in the day. So I know you guys a little yeah. separately, and then listening to the bad astronaut stuff is just, it's just really. Awesome. I don't know why it took me so long to find it. I kind of blame my friends because they didn't tell me about it because that's how you're supposed well, to find you know, music. It was, right? like, it, it was one of those bands where we didn't even have any social media stuff when that started. I mean, we were so – we didn't promote. Mm-hmm. And the main thing is we didn't tour. But, you know, we had never played a show before. I don't know. Marco knows. Marco remembers the dates. I just – know the facts <laughs> and the yeah. facts were like real bands tour real bands actually let people know they exist <laughs> we were like a band that took photos like twice yeah and yeah. like never toured and so it's really no one's fault that they that people didn't hear about us but the cool thing about it is in a weird way now after all these years there's almost like a, a very loyal kind of i want to say cult but then i sound like i'm Pat myself, but it has a sort of a strange, really dedicated following, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think that, I mean, I think one thing I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this too. Most people I I meet that are in bands are primarily just like giant music fans. And, you know, like I know that Joey and I have that in common where when we're hanging out, we're, we're, you know, 90% of the conversation is about how excited we are about other music that we're listening to or other bands that we're checking out or whatever. It's like, we're just huge super fans of music. Mm-hmm. And then what makes you become a musician is because you want to get inside of it. You just, you're, you're so into music. You, it's not enough to just like, it's like you, it's like you've got a bar in your house. <laughs> you can't just go to the bar. You got to have your own bar. <laughs> of That's kind of why we all started bands, things. you know? And it's like, um, and I think that, that that's like a through line with us. And, and so as, as fans, you realize like certain bands you like, you start to get attracted to the, like the, the, maybe the mystique and some of the mythology about it too is kind of part of the fun of being a music fan. And I don't think we designed that with that astronaut. I think it was simply just like, we were just kind of victims of circumstances. Joey was in Lagwagon, really busy band, you know, Sugar Cult. And when Bad Astronaut started, Sugar Cult was just getting like off to the races. Yeah. So we were both really busy. And the spirit of Bad Astronaut was really just like us. We all come from the same hometown. We all come from Santa Barbara. And it was like Joey, me, and our, and our old friend Derek Plore that we both grew up with and used to be the original drummer of Lagwagon. Just like us drinking, literally like sitting at your bar, like they're drinking and just kind of. <laughs> Are you saying Just that we're are you saying that we're going to have to do a side project together now too? Is that is that how it's going to have to happen? Oh. Oh, 100%. As soon as the <laughs> pandemic's over, you're never going to get rid of me and Joey. We're gonna, now that we Marco, know just, Hendrix whatever you and, do, Marco, don't answer all of his questions before you ask any. Oh, yeah. Questions. That's what I always do. It. Yeah. yeah Marco, likes, Marco is a writer. And so <laughs> like, Once you get me started, I'll never shut up. He's no, I love funny. it. Yeah. Like, it's I mean, podcasting, like, man. Let's get into the weeds. We got It's long for What's that? But yeah, I think that has a lot you will bad you astronaut. Get the whole history if I don't stop it. <laughs> right? Yeah, stop like, at the end of it. Well, that's good. That's what they're tuning in for. Like, all right, we're good. Well, yeah. So, so it's one of those bands that we we just kind of decide we're like, let's let's not. We don't need any photos and tours and T-shirts and all that because this is just for fun. We're just doing this just for like us and you know, this is a distraction kind of. Yeah, really. I mean, in yeah. the beginning, I think. Marco, to that point, I think it was just me and Derek had been really old friends and I would wanted to play with Derek again really bad. And we, you know, he was, we were hanging again and, and then it was just kind of like, we're probably just drinking one night and it was like, let's jam. Awesome. Exactly. Is, we, we had a jam jar at, uh, <laughs> at our practices because you're not allowed to say that word. And I feel like I should put a $50 bill on my computer right now for saying it because it's a bummer. <laughs> But but yeah, that's a lot really of the deal, and we just started playing in some really danky, moldy, terrible like little garage in a bad part of town, and like just we'd get like three bottles of Captain Morgan and 
think the first song that we w- arranged was called Catherine Morgan because Derek was dating this girl Catherine. We, we didn't. I, we did not really have any plans to do anything, and then we just started. I think we just liked it so much. It, we and we had a number of songs, and then we were like, we should make a record. I mean, and you know, we I I paid for the records. We weren't. I didn't think it didn't feel like we had any plans to do anything, and then it just kept going. Yeah, it's just kind of a side, pro- like an art project that kind of spun out of control because, like, we were making the record at this studio. Like, you know, Joey hired this local studio, and the guy who owned the studio was a guy named Angus Cook who plays cello, plays this electric cello. Yeah. And, like, he was just, you know, kind of engineering and there. And so it was like, hey, why don't you lay down some cello? And then it was kind of like, well, fuck it. We're not a real band anyway, so why don't you join our band <laughs> no. too? And this, the other guy there <laughs> that, was Tom. That is he, the single funniest thing about this yeah. band. D- I've never been in a band that didn't rehearse before they, like, you know, were... I mean, we, we would do that thing where it would be like, somebody would come play on the record and be like, you want to be in the band? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, totally. I mean, it's not a real... You know what? I just realized that, Joey, I just realized why we did that. It was the, it was our workaround in order to get people to play on our record without having to pay them. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh. Now, that's <laughs> something to, for all the kids <laughs> like, at home wanting to start bands. You're a guitar player? Yeah. No, yeah, that, that's like, that's a good that's lesson. A workaround for bands. Marco, let him talk. Yeah, you're in the band. That means you get to like share in all the glory. There's yeah. none, none of which there's going to be for this band because we're not going to. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. No, it's fantastic. That's that's a great. That, as I said, that's a great. Uh, so we ended up model. with like seven people in our band at one point. Marco, yeah, do you? Awesome. Hey, Marco, do you yeah. have Johnny on mute? <laughs> oh. You do think because I'm just talking so much? Is that what you're saying, Joey? I feel like he keeps trying to say stuff, and you it's just go, good. "Yeah," because like you know what? No, <laughs> no it's all good, man. That's what the show's it's about. Because guys. I'm not drinking. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Sober guy's a buzzkill. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys gotta kick me. You should just like phase me out of this. Thing yeah, no soon. way, dude. This is awesome. This is what the no, kids want to hear. Yeah, they want to listen. People on the wagon. No, not allowed. They want to hear you go into the weeds on stuff. So I, I'm actually, oh, I'm sure. digging yeah, this. Just, no, this is great. I've been drumming all day. I'm like completely dumb right now. I'm what were you awesome. working on today? Uh, I'm, I'm making a new solo record, which was done. And then I just did what I always do. I went, it needs something else. Mm-hmm. And then I just put drums on a track like a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. And I was like, oh, right. Uh, you know, it's weird. I'm playing all the instruments on it for the first time. Like I've gotten close on records, but I mean, I really played every single thing. Wow. So drums were my first instrument. I'm a little rusty to say yeah. the least. You started so, as a drummer drums before. Like, Is that what you're saying? You, you started I did. as a drummer? I, my first instrument when I was like nine years old was drums. Wow. And I played drums till I was about 16 or 17, 18, whenever you go to college, mm-hmm. when I went to college, it was like drums. Like you can't cart drums around. I don't know how drummers stay drummers. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pain in the ass. You need you a just, truck and yeah. Yeah. And I had a truck, but yeah. I just got sick of like, yeah. Okay. Band practice for an hour. Let me just get my drums, load them in my truck, drive to wherever we're going to rehearse, unload them, then load them. Like, no way. (laughs) And so I started playing guitar, and then I eventually played guitar in bands, and then eventually our singer was a dick, and I started singing because we we kicked him out in the middle of the studio or whatever. It's not my fault. I didn't want to be a singer. Um, That's incredible to me because you have one of my favorite voices of, of like, almost any band. Your voice is so distinct, and it's one of my favorite voices. That's really nice. It's re- yeah. I hate my voice so much. <laughs> that, so you're not <laughs> like a singer at all. Voice. You're not like a real singer then, because a lot of singers love hearing their own voice. Uh-uh. <laughs> oh, really? I don't wow. know. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I always, it, I always equate it to like, you know, when you hear yourself on someone's answering machine, you go, oh my God, is that what I sound like? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, you're it's like, not your own voice. I just sound so... Lame, like you know, and that's how singing is, but a million times worse. And everything I sing, when I hear it, it sounds out of tune. It's a little bit like a torture to be a singer if you don't really have much better uh, hearing than I do actual body, um, 
you know, instrument behavior. Like what you hear in your head is better than what you can produce. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everything I sing is out of tune, and I just go, <laughs> oh, man. Like, I love producing real singers that, that the guys and girls that were born with this talent, like, they just sing, and you go, wow. And, like, every note sounds in tune to me. Those are the funnest people to work with because, you know, but when you're producing your own stuff in lockdown, I wanted to make a lockdown record. You know, I've been sitting. I mean, I'll show you. It's right back yeah. here. This is my little studio right there. That's oh, right. That's some Look cool. how big it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's massive, it's man. So gnarly. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's really, you can really spread out in this room. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've been working here in this little corner by myself for like ever. And then finally, when I started doing drums, it was when me and a friend of mine, you know, people started getting vaccinated and stuff out here. So, yeah. So I was able to go in about two weeks ago and it's just, oh my God, it feels good to be in a real studio. And I'm, I'm only playing drums now, but God, it's fun to play drums. I really wish I was a drummer. I love hitting things, you know? Well, now, well, now you just have everyone come to you so you could go back to the drumming. You, you, you don't need to lug it around. You can just say, hey. You know, I'm Joey Cape. If you want to play with me, you got to come to 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 me because I'm not moving the fucking drums around. I thought you were gonna say, "Yeah, hey, I'm Joey Cape. If you want me to produce your record, you gotta let me play drums on it." That would. There you go, too, man. There you go. I'm not very good. <laughs> not at all. Uh, you know, something really cool about not being a great drummer is that you can only do what's in your head that you were going to tell another drummer to do anyway. Mm-hmm. And you don't have that issue of like, I'm hearing this like Pixie song with a super basic drum beat, but I want the groove like this. You can just play it and you don't have to deal with the guy all. Yeah, that's cool. That's really boring. I'm going to do this. <laughs> yeah. You know, every drummer just has yeah. to go nuts. And not every drummer, some drummers aren't like that, but I've dealt with a lot of drummers that just want to play a lot. And listen, I totally get it. If you're a good musician, why wouldn't you want to challenge yourself? Dude, I was, I was listening to like, I was, it was, I can't remember if I was reading it or listening to like a uh, interview with a guy, Nigel Godrich, who produced Radiohead's records that, you know, had a big influence on Bad Astronaut, actually, Mm -hmm. like OK Computer and and Kid A and stuff like that. And, um, and he was saying like, when they're making Radiohead records, very often they'll like have the bass player play drums on a song or on a part of a song or like, they'll be like, who's the worst drummer in the band? They'll be like, our singer can barely even like keep a beat. And they're like, perfect. You go play drums on this part of the song. Wow. That's yeah. smart. Right. Cause it's like you, that way you get that performance where it sounds like innocent and sort of like, you know, it sounds really like a child is playing it or yeah. something. And that's what you, if that, you know, sometimes that's what you want. And, they're, yeah. and a guy who's like, got who's who's got groove and is a real drummer why do i feel like you're insulting me right now though like it's not that bad (laughs) (laughs) but but still there's something you said for that like i love when that kind of shit happens in the studio where you're like dude you play bass on this song you play guitar on this part just because that's when you get that magic and and i mean yeah i don't want to sound like pretentious but really that was kind of the mandate in bad astronaut if there was a mandate it was kind of like well we've already got our own quote-unquote real bands where, you know, we play our roles in our real band. Like Joey's the singer of Loud and I'm the guitarist of Sugar Cult and all this stuff. It's like this band, it's just kind of like, fuck it. This is, we're just doing this for fun. And mm-hmm. because, you know, maybe we'll put it out there. I mean, we're kind of just workaholics and naturally it's just going to be like, well, shit, now we should probably put this out and uh, finish it. And, um, but yeah, it was just, it was never governed by like worrying about whether we were going to need to be able to produce it, reproduce it live or take it on tour. Yeah. Um, it was there just kind of like other, I, there's another aspect that, that, you know, that really made that, that sealed that, that made mm-hmm. that the way it had to be. And that was that when we, when we first started recording, it was just me and Derek and Marco. And we, you know, we laid down like basics for all these songs we learned. And then it was kind of like me and hard drives for like a year, just going to like, talk, Hey, Todd Caps, what are you doing, man? He's like nothing. And you know, most of our buds that were, good players and stuff had their own home studios so i would just show up with like back in the days of like the like i mean like hard drives yeah like a tower how many we had yeah and then we we did a bunch of drums on two inch tape boy it was i don't miss those days man there was a lot involved (laughs) technically to make those records but it was super fun and then it was really fun to like go to derek and marco and go check out what this guy did on keys 
Mm-hmm. And yeah. then it's like, oh my God, like we're making like this amazing record that we'll never reproduce. And that's kind of the way we looked at it. But we really did look at it like this is about recording. It's about creativity. Yeah. We're never going to tour. And it was, uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, a lot of happy accidents and a lot of reactive kind of playing where it's not like you're a typical band where you like rehearse songs in the studio and then go in the studio and lay them, go in the recording studio and lay them down. This was more like the songs were sort of like coming together while they were being recorded. You know, yeah. if we make a mistake, yeah. we kind of yeah. go, well, fuck, let's run in the direction of that mistake rather than like repairing it. Let's just make that part of the song. Yeah. That's and cool. then somebody in the room would go, wouldn't it be cool if right there, there was like a full bar break or a bar and a half with like just some musical interlude for a second. And then the drums come back. I mean, we would just be like, the songs would get longer and longer. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's I fun. It's so fun. You know, it's really fun counterbalance for our other bands too, because it's that astronaut just had such a different sort of mindset. It wasn't like, okay, yeah. let's keep this like really straightforward and catchy or let's keep this really, it was, it was kind of like this like experimental, like, fuck it, dude. Maybe we'll like, I remember Joey, um, I, there was this bass part we did in rehearsal and we had like some shitty little rehearsal tape and Joey was like, dude, we were like, we should recreate that. And then he was like, actually, fuck it. We're, we're never going to be able to capture that the same way. So he took yeah. the like cassette tape which was like totally like, you know, out of tune and everything and like played it through a phaser, through a microphone, through a phaser, and then like just captured that and then dropped it into the track. So it was wow. like the actual like improv part from when we were first writing the song and just like little things like that would happen. I remember Joey went yeah. to Radio Shack and bought a bunch of, like, you, didn't you go to like Radio Shack and just buy like every fucking like. I bought every lavalier mic they made. And wow. yeah. when we would record drums, I would have like. 22 uh mics live and at least seven would be like you know pzm and lavalier mics on like drums and you know and they would just that's break. wild yeah was like, distorting right mic, on the you know? surface. that was so yeah that was kind of the whole thing the whole thing was like i my band was doing pretty well then and i had like i, I wasn't married mm-hmm. i didn't have a kid i was kind of a loser as far as like you know <laughs> having anywhere to live like i just was like i have money yeah and i've never had money i'm gonna spend all of it on this band i'm not so sure what a great decision that was but then you yeah you did all that up front but then didn't take photos or promote it at all and anything right. after that whereas <laughs> yeah we're very we're stubborn right. and, and i mean that comes from like I mean, it sounds so pretentious to say, but but we do come from a town, as much as Santa Barbara, you think of Santa Barbara as a nice kind of well-to-do town. The the predominant style of music that was coming up when Joey and I were, were just cutting our teeth was punk rock. Because the, mm-hmm. the band we had as our like local band in town that was doing something was this band RKL, which of which now like half the members are in Lag Wagon, right? Like yeah. Joey kind yeah, of grew up with those we're guys. Like, we're, you know... I mean, I grew up in the narcore scene too. I right. mean, we're a part of that, you know? Yeah. And so, that, that scene was like right down the street. Yeah. So, I mean, even no effects was a big part of it. And they were narcore bands. Yeah. So that's kind of where we came. And then, so being into these other kind of bands and doing this kind of band, um, it's not that we couldn't have done something. I was just, I don't know. The only thing that makes me sad when I think about the band is I, I wish we'd have played one show with Derek. That's yeah, it's, really it, that's, it's sad because we eventually did start playing some shows, but it was long after Derek died. Um, yeah, but, uh, my producer know, was actually was his, my producer yeah. was actually one of them here locally at a uh, at Chain Reaction. You guys did like a couple uh, acoustic oh, yeah. tours, that's or right. like one one yeah, acoustic that was tour, a, a tiny little short tour, and we played Chain Reaction, and we opened for like this guy who was one of those piano emo rock bands, but he played piano. I don't remember. Isn't it like suddenly Sunday or something? Do you remember Marco? No, Headliner? I don't remember that. Oh. <laughs> oh, my producer just said, I, I looked over to him to see if he remembered who it was. And he's like, no, I left after, uh, after, after oh, bad ass. <laughs> <laughs> that place had some people that knew the band, but it was like predominantly in front of us was like 14 year old girls just looking at their phone. Oh, I forgot yeah. about that. Wait, wasn't it like, it wasn't, ta- it wasn't like, there was a band that it sounded like Dashboard Confessional, but it was like a different type. And it was like, it was a piano player. It was like a blonde kid that played piano and he had a band. It was one of those kind of bands. And not the kid called, from something corporate. Not that guy. No, no, no. It was called like Suddenly Susan, like the TV show. It was something really <laughs> terrible. 
Okay. Um, I don't remember that. And I, I watched the guy play because I wanted to see what all those little girls cared about. And, you know, it, it was awful. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> this kid, this kid is like, is now like, he's like, oh man, I can't believe I got to play with those guys. And he's listening to this right now. He's going, motherfucker. <laughs> well, he could say play, but it just wasn't for me. I, yeah, I yeah. Say. I shouldn't be. Well, music um, is. Thing. Yeah, but music that is... show was definitely not our yeah. show. Like we, you know, that whole thing. I mean, we. I, I like the Eagle Rock show was pretty cool. I thought. Oh, that was mm-hmm. super fun that venue, and then the one we played at the Casbah in San Diego. That was kind of fun. I mean, it was just fun because yeah. this band was not at all like it's not at all designed to be a punk rock band and play like a random little like dive bar or something like that. Yeah. But. It's it's kind of fun to fill a space like that and have all these people on stage, someone playing cello and someone playing keyboards and, you know, all of us with big, you know, just pedal boards and the whole thing and not be playing music that like playing music that's like you could sit there and drink like a hazy IPA and like be <laughs> soaked, you know. They, they, the what, I think they call that whatever, crunchy. I think with, they call that crunchy. I mean, you got a, you got a crunchy I, jam. I, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's just, but, but the point, like, the point I was making when I brought up the punk rock, thing from from our upbringing is like there wasn't that it wasn't drilled into us that what you do needs to be something that's money minded it wasn't like oh you got to do something and then make it big or become famous or you know a lot of our bands did make it big and become famous but yeah. it wasn't necessarily by design it wasn't like that's what we were going for and with bad astronaut it was especially that we were like yeah this probably doesn't make that much sense to like not play shows and not like do press and not do all this stuff but who cares? Like, fuck it. Let's do it anyway. Like, let's just do it. Like, so, so I, I, I don't think a band like that, like those records that we made would have been able to happen and be as like open. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, just kind of like free form as they mm-hmm. are. If we had that, like, if we were like tethered by this, like, oh shit, we got to make sure we can do this live or we got to make sure we can, um, you know, it's it, it wasn't it wasn't made with the idea of being efficient. It was just made with the idea of having fun and yeah. being. I'm glad you guys put it together because I, I I listen to these three records uh, that were you know back from two, early 2000s, and as I said said before, it was something that I hadn't really listened to until very recently. And hearing all that eclectic um, you know songwriting that you guys did and putting it together, now learning how you even put it together. I mean, it's it's just great stuff, guys. Like, I and I love the second record title, Houston. We have a drinking problem. That's a great title for anyone who doesn't know that one. Go go out and check that one out too. We had to do it. It was just too obvious. We had to go for it. <laughs> yeah, some, sometimes the obvious jokes are the best ones, right? Oh God, yeah. It's like that that thing where you go, I can't believe that's not taken. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. You have an idea and then you kind of like Google it or something and you go, how is this not taken? Yeah. Well, on speaking on those three records though too, um, on April 23rd, you guys are going to be releasing a box set and you're calling it Universe, right? And it and uh, and there'll be a new seven inch yeah. inside of it uh, called Inner Space. And the new song that people can go listen to right now before April 23rd is Wide Awake. It's a great song too. Is when I'm listening to this song, you know, going back to some of your singing there, Joey, it's it's very different from some of the other styles I've heard you do. And uh, yeah. well, I yeah, I didn't write this song. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's 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 the understanding of it. <laughs> I wrote the lyrics, but not the melody. Okay, or the that's arrangement like, or that's, anything at all. It, it almost has like a Bowie. Or, it almost has like a or, David Bowie esque like thing to it. It was just it. like. Todd Capps, our keyboard player, the favorite song he's ever written for the band, and it was just one of those things where I had some material. We were talking about doing something in lockdown, like where we all sent files, you know, to each other, and we were just going to try to do this thing for fun. Mm-hmm. And Todd sent something that was kind of like already there in a way, like it just needed drums and bass and guitar, and like it was just like, and and I looked at it like, well, this thing's kind of ready. And I really honestly thought that I was going to maybe have more of an influence on what it was. But the truth of the matter is, Todd really just wanted it to be so. So, and it's a killer song, you yeah. know. So I just tried to sing it exactly how this, this sort of scratch was, which was basically piano. on the. It was a piano line, but I didn't change anything. Mm-hmm. And, and and also when the when, when I got it and started doing vocals, 
it just needed to be clean. Yeah. Like I had to just think clean. And so it is kind of trippy. Like when I listen to it, it, it's, it might be one of the cleaner kind of sounding vocals and, and everything, but somehow I don't get it, but somehow it totally fits. Like it sounds, I would have been more stoked if it was on a full album, but I don't listen to it and go, this isn't bad astronaut, but I know I didn't write it. Gotcha. So, you know, it's, it's, and I know when I was singing it, I was like a little uncomfortable because it was, I was following a melody that I wouldn't necessarily exactly sing, you know? Right. It was, but it, see, it, that, that to me, what makes it Bad Astronaut is exactly that, is it's something that is a little off kilter. You know, it started off with Bad Astronaut was like songs that weren't really right for Lagwagon, but mm-hmm. they were still great songs, you know? And so like, that's maybe what makes Bad, what is Bad Astronaut? Bad Astronaut is kind of like, as long as it's got Joey singing and it's something that wouldn't necessarily sit on a Lagwagon record, perfectly or um even though some of our songs i think sound similar to stuff on Lagwagon, but you know the way angus is going to touch it with his cello the way um you know the way todd's going to react to it with keyboards the way joey's going to just behave differently melodically because he's in a room with different people than mm-hmm. the guys in Lagwagon. you know it's a different there's all these different kind of intangibles that make something whatever it is and they become certain bands just become bigger than the sum of their parts, you know, even if it's the same writers, you know, think of So, so it's a trip that way. And I think it's really healthy. Honestly, I think everybody in a band, every person in a band should have side projects. I think it's really good for everybody as, as musicians. It's good. It's more fun. You know, yeah. that, it, I know in sugar cult, we had less like, arguments in the band when each of us had our own side projects. Cause it wasn't like we were trying to like force everything into this one little. Yeah. You have an outlet with, and, you know? and you get a, yeah, you have an outlet to kind of take, uh, you know, you know, we're not all one dimensional musicians, right? So you want to be able to like get out there and do something a little different and learn from those side projects and bring them back maybe to your main gig or whatever it is in a lot of ways. Cause you're going to learn sure. a different way to write. You're going to learn a different way to explore the studio, whatever it may I mean, be. It's true what Marco says. I mean, Bad Astronaut really, for me, the, the the sort of, you know, catalyst of the band was I started writing things that the guys in Lagwagon just didn't want to do. Mm. And, you know, and I started saying, like, I'm going to have piano on this thing. And then, like, there's going to be a cello here. And all in feelings, you know, the let's talk about feelings record. Yeah. And the, the best example is the song Owen Meany. And you know, we rocked it up a bit, but it was, I think, you know, those guys, they dug it, but they were kind of like, oof, getting real close to a solar project here, buddy. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, Because <laughs> it just didn't feel right for all of them. And and I that's when I kind of started to realize, like, I really do like side projects. I agree with Marco. It's important to do them. Mm-hmm. But I also don't see music as like a gang thing at all. I don't really understand anybody that doesn't like to just explore because it's, I don't under, you know, I don't know how you can remain happy. Like I love the Ramones. They were one of my favorite punk bands of all time, but if I had been in the Ramones, I would have shot myself (laughs) because, you know, there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of experimental stuff, right? No, it's just do up rock and roll, which is fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. But if I had to play it, if I had to play it. <laughs> you just yeah. you just remind me of that great ACDC, the Angus Qu- Young quote, or I, I don't remember how many records they had out at, the, at this point. They said like, "Hey man, uh, does it ever get you know about ACDC that the guy was like, dude, does it ever bother you that you guys have like twelve records that sound exactly the same?" And he's all, "You're absolutely wrong." We don't have 12 records that sound exactly the same. We have 14 records that sound exactly the same. Like, <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a band though too. Yeah, they, they, he just loves it though. You know, you could tell Angus just loves it. Oh, yeah, he's he's it. like, it, he owns it. It's like, for sure. And it's like, it's such a beautiful thing, what they do and the Ramones. It's such a pure thing, but yeah, it's like, exactly. I don't know. Um, I just feel like, I mean, it's like relationships, you know, if, if you're, you know, if, imagine if you only ever hung out with one person all the time, you would fucking yeah. drive each other crazy. You got to have like, you know, friends. Marco, <laughs> what you're trying to say for the woke people is imagine sleeping with the same woman. <laughs> I know. Come on, you guys got to have a mistress. We know you're with this. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm happily married. I don't, I don't, I, you know. I'm ha- yeah, I'm happily married too, <laughs> but I will say that one of the things that keeps me married is the fact that I have like 
groups of friends, other friends that I can hang out with. It's not like, you know, and that otherwise, you know, it's like, and, and I think the same thing with music, having other outlets. I love that Joey's doing this solo project where yeah. he's playing all the instruments. That's the, that's the, that's the shit that keeps you, the romance alive. Otherwise you're just like, fuck it, you know, same old shit. Let's do it. You know, got to try gotta different things. A little bit. You got to mix it up in the studio. You got to yeah, mix it up in the bedroom. Still- Don't worry, guys. Your wives won't listen to this. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not married anymore. You're so not married anymore. Matter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're good. Uh, yeah, but I still don't want her to listen to it because you know we need to get along. Yeah. <laughs> you got to. Yeah. You got to. There's a kid involved, yeah. right? <laughs> you have a daughter, right, Joey? How, was, yeah. how old's your daughter? Seventeen. Seventeen. Okay. Wow. Yeah. She's she's a woman now. Yeah. She's a grown up now. Um, she, That's she so did, gnarly. And Marco, you have a son, right? Or Multiple kids. I have two kids. I have a son and a daughter. So my my son just turned sixteen. I think he's like literally almost exactly a year younger than Joey's daughter. And then um, my daughter is fourteen. So they're about a year and a half apart. So gotcha. yeah, totally. Like we're, we all have teenage children, which is crazy. That is yeah. wild. I got a four year old, so I'm not quite at where you guys are. But yeah, he's uh oh, four, he's, that's a funny. Yeah, he's he's that's pretty awesome. rad. Four is great. <laughs> I, I will tell you i know i sound like an old lady i sound like an old lady at the playground but like they really do grow up fast dude i'm telling you like oh, yeah. it'll just as soon as they start hitting grade school it's just like boom you know oh i, I could already see it that in the, in the short in the fun, short four years i could already see that you know that's a some some sayings are, yeah, yeah. are just it's super great. true and <laughs> even as cliche as they can become over the oh, years sure. it's just super true For sure I want to ask about that though, because, uh, on, on Houston, we have a drinking problem. There's a song called if I had a son now who wrote that one. And what, I mean, did you, if you said your kids 17 and 16, you guys were probably just having kids around the same time, right? Like they were, they were young when you, when you wrote the song. Yeah. Well, like, I wasn't born. I wrote that song in like 2000 or something like yeah. that. Like, was born in 2004. Okay. So I was, I wasn't even with my wife yet. Yeah. I just wrote a song. I don't know. I just had this idea that, um, you know, if I was writing a song, sort of like a letter to younger people about what not to worry about, that I've had to figure out the hard way okay. and, and how to kind of, you know, navigate life and its problems and people being shitty and the things that happen to you. So it was kind of like a letter, but then I started thinking about it. Wow, it feels like I'm writing a letter to a child that, you know, I don't have. And then and then I just like the sound of if I had a son, like mm-hmm. this is what I would tell him. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's that's all that was. Yeah. That's that's, and then, and that's then awesome that it was before you had a daughter. <laughs> yeah, and then you had a daughter. <laughs> yeah. And, and and to weave into the box set that's coming out. Um, on the on the inner space seven inch. So one side is the new song Wide Awake, and on the other side is a song that is basically like it's kind of found object art because we found this track. That Joey was looking through all these fi- like files, and he found a track that was basically unfinished. Where we had our drummer Derek, who's no longer with us. He's actually Derek died like ten days after I had my first kid, so he's been oh, dead wow. for sixteen years now, which is crazy to think. But um, Derek had tracked drums, right, Joey, for for yeah. the, for the uh, like more electric version of Violet. Yeah. And then we added to it recently. Like I went in the studio and tracked on it, and and we had a Tom track on it. And so we have this song that's kind of this weird like patchwork quilt through the years of uh, mm. some old right. tracks. But you know added. that the song is actually on Twelve Small Steps. It is, yeah. but a different version of it, right? Barely. You're right. <laughs> it doesn't have the little Prague Bridge in it. But I am such a lame First of all, I have a hard drive that's just this bad astronaut master drive that I had years ago when I had a studio in my home before I kind of gutted the studio. That drive uh, was copied and, you know, was backed up and it had, I don't even know how many like outtakes from the records. It was like someday we were going to release this outtakes record. And I hate talking about this because it makes me really sad, but Sorry. When we went in and we did Wide Awake, the label said, hey, you know, you should make a B-side so we can do like a seven inch. And I was like, that's a great idea. We have tons of material that Derek played on that we could just finish. And most of which, the way I remember, didn't have vocals, but it had melodies. So I just 
go through all that stuff with Tom, our guitar player, because he's here in town with me. And so I went to his studio. Fucking hard drive didn't work. Put in the second hard drive. It didn't work. And oh, then I was man. like, oh, my God. I was so devastated. Oh, man. Well, I'm going to send the hard drives to somebody, and hopefully they'll be able to pull the disc out and retrieve the information. But that was kind of heartbreaking. And then we started going over all these other hard drives I had, and we came across that song. And I think I was feeling a little blurry at that point, and I went, that's Derek Drumming. That's a song. I didn't even bother to check the records. I yeah. just went so like... Classic. I was like, this is a song from my split with Tony Sly, but we actually, I remember I had Derek Drum on it when we made whatever record, and fuck, man, we never released this. <laughs> then we finished the whole goddamn song, and one of my friends, like, like I, said, I played it for a friend, and he was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's a little different than the version on 12, so that, you know, yeah. and I was like, what? I'm surprised me and Tom. You didn't even realize that, it. I love that. But but no but, one you know the version, the version on Twelve Small Steps doesn't have as much instrumentation on it, right? I haven't listened to it in a minute. It doesn't have the breakdown bridge, right? And it and the ending's a little different, right? And two but it's really different. like it's really close. And then you know we redid the vocals, and right. we we um you know we redid a lot of stuff on it. So, so you get a completely revised version of yeah. Violet, and the reason that you know. The, but, you know, that song was written, like, r shortly after Joey became a dad, you know. So, I wrote that song for a split that I did with Tony Sly where we covered our own bands. Um, it was called Acoustic. And each of us decided, okay, but we don't want it to only be covers. Like, we like doing this songwriting thing. So let's each write one song. And he wrote a song called, uh, what's it called? Um, Stunt Double. Okay. And I wrote the song Violet. And both of us were new fathers. His daughter was born in the same month as my my daughter. Oh, that close. And okay. So we, yeah, it's kind of neat in a way. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then way later, somehow or another, we had put drums on it with Derek, and it did make that record. But I, I just, I don't listen to my own records. I, how am I supposed to know? <laughs> <laughs> you think someone at that would have caught it too? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so the cool thing is. We ended up like completely like re, you know, coming at that song with fresh ears and, uh, for, you know, years later. And, and I personally like the new, the, oh, the it's new cool. version of it better. You know, I think it's yeah. way cooler. Yeah, me too. Um, and it's, but it's the B know. side. So, you know, there was some talk about it when we figured out, should we go back to the drawing board and record a song that's unreleased? And it was like, it's a B side. You know, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I'm I'm glad you guys are doing this, but it's been 15 years since you've released anything for uh, Bad Astronaut, and that was after uh, you. Oh, you said it's been 16 years, right, since Derek's past, and uh, we do have yeah. that in common when we lost the Jimmy the Rev Sullivan in 2010. Um, so there's something that I do know a little bit about. You know, having a childhood friend, he grew up with us yeah. and everything. And um, for us, uh, in Avenged Sunfold, there was several periods of time where we didn't know we were going to keep on going and had we not already finished that last yeah. record with him, we wouldn't have. Um, so I guess I go a long way around the block to ask the question, why now? Why 15 years later? Why the universe box set with the new song and, and the B side with, with Derek is, is this all to honor? I is got it, this, this one, one, Mark. I, I got this one. I, I mean, the vinyl thing was, you know, it bothered me forever because I think when we originally released uh, the first thing we released, we p actually put it out on my label and then uh, Mike and Aaron at fat were just like, we love this band. And I was like, we, we got another record. Yeah. And so we ended up on fat or honest Dawn's back then their side label thing. But the truth of the matter is I think when we kind of were man, when we were putting the deal together, I was like, you know, I'd like to just hold on to these records for vinyl and do them with like a different indie, you know? And so at some point uh, we, we did the first EP, we were going to release them in succession, but we released Ac Acrophobe on vinyl on suburban home records. Mm. And, and, and I guess really what happened there was um, Virgil's label, uh, they went under at some point and we just never got to continue that, that, trilogy we were going to do and 
anyway, so then years and years went by. And I mean, believe me, I had a thousand conversations with fat about it where, you know, people on the road would ask me or people would write fat, like, are you ever going to put the bad astronaut stuff on stuff on vinyl? Because uh, the original release that we did for the one thing, the short record, um, there was really, it was a limited pressing as well. So there were a lot of, you know, there's a lot of vinyl people. People love vinyl. And, yeah. And so it's been pressing forever. But I always had this thing where it was never mastered for vinyl. The other records is, weren't. And also, where the fuck are the mixes? Like, some of that stuff was on tape. Some of it was here. So it was like a burden that was on me. I had to go and find the stuff, figure it out. Because I'm somewhat of an audiophile, I don't really want to do it wrong. Yeah, and that's why it took so long. Is it's the 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 problem is mine for sure, and I it's my fault. But I I think what finally happened is this sort of on a whim, like talking to the guys. We did like a Zoom meeting or something. Yeah, right? Marco just yeah. hanging. And yeah. then early and early on in the yeah. pandemic, let's yeah. record a song. You know, when yeah. we all had a few drinks and. <laughs> All, all then, great ideas know, come from that. On... <laughs> it's so sad, right. but true, right? Yeah. Declaration of independence. <laughs> yeah, and so that, that, then I started thinking about the box set again, and I started talking to Fat, and we had to do a very interesting thing that I've never done before, but many people know about it. I had no idea it existed. And what it is is, is a, a kind of reverse processing, uh, I guess, mastering from a master. So... They do it at Abbey Road. They do hmm. it at a place called like the Bakery or something. There's a, a bunch of places that do it. And they take your CD master and they run it through this complex, you know, transient, um, you know, it, 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 it just basically, uh, it really looks at the, the transients and the, the wave files and everything. And it, it kind of like spits out what would be a vinyl master. Wow. From that stuff, like reverse mastering. It's very weird because, you know, ma uh, vinyl masters have to be a little darker. They can't be as bright. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be quite as loud or you get distortion. And, you know, so anyway, uh, turns out Pirates Press do this as well. Because when we when we looked at Abbey Road, it was $10,000 a side. A side? I mean, are you kidding me? A that's side. Cool. That's, yeah. we have, we have that's going to get expensive. Here, right? So yeah. we're like... Yeah. And we were going to maybe just do double vinyl since some of the records are so long and we didn't, we wanted to achieve the best sound quality. Yeah. So we ended up doing double vinyl on them and yeah, it was like, Oh my God, like this is, <laughs> we can't do this. No, there's no money in this yeah, we, or no budget for this. And I don't know, long story short, uh, somehow fat records figured out a way through and I'm just so stoked. Because yeah. it is very weird that a guy who loves vinyl so much, I I can't believe that I've been in this band I love for so long and never had vinyl copies. Like, it's stupid. Yeah. So I'm glad we we were, this is this is like a huge relief for me. Well, it's it's, it's just yeah. it's such an awesome uh, you know it's such a it's it's such a like gift for us. It's such a celebration because we make these records. And you hope that anyone's going to like care about them. And then like Joey said, this kind of like underground following is kind of just spread around the world. I'd be like touring around with Sugar Cult and people would come up to me in Germany or wherever I was and be like, dude, tell me about that astronaut. And That's you're funny. like, how do you even know about this? And I just, I love that the people have had that joy of discovery with this band. How many times have you been asked by people why it's not on vinyl? I feel like. Oh yeah. And, and, and the kinds of people who like Bad Astronaut, and I'm being kind of stereotypical and generalizing here, are definitely the kinds of people who like really love listening to music. Like they listen to mm -hmm. music with good, good stereos or headphones mm -hmm. or whatever. And they, they want to, and there's so much, I mean, I'm, you know, I have to blow Joey up because he's never going to blow himself up, but he's a really good producer. Like you're mm -hmm. probably supposed to be a producer, you know, like he's just the way he, the attention to detail in these records, it's really a lot to do with him. He's kind of like the Brian Wilson of bad astronaut, just in there, just looking mad scientists having like nervous breakdowns over the most minute details of, of symbol decay. You know, it's wow. just fucking, it's, Johnny, like, it's called, it's called OCD. Yeah. yeah okay. There we go. <laughs> Fair enough. It's Fair enough. OCD. But this guy, he's, yeah, it, it, it serves no purpose you other fucking than, do in the studio, yeah. dude. But like, but those records deserve that. that. 
audiophile experience where you can really kind of savor it and listen to it. And of course, you can listen to it on Spotify or any of that shit too. But like, you know, this is the kind of music that you really want, you know, like, it's, I want to think that someone's sitting down and getting, like, pouring themselves a drink of good stuff, like your Hendrix gin or whatever you got back there, you know, making something really good and putting on things. a record and just, like, sitting with their, and like, actually listening to the, listening to the record rather than just having it playing in the background while they're, like, tidying up their house or something. Like, it's a, you know, and then you're going to hear these records and, it, and you're going to hear so many little, like, ear candies that are tucked away in it. And it's just kind of cool. Just, um, 15 years. I'm- you know, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's been so long, but yeah. I'm excited and terrified to hear the vinyl because, you know, because of lockdown and because I had I moved to a different town to kind of take care of my folks and stuff at the beginning of all this. Mm-hmm. This is probably the first thing I've ever been involved with where I didn't hear the test press. And it's like I have no idea. Oh how wow! It came out. I just have a buddy that works at Pirates who told me it's solid. Okay. So I was like, I trust that dude. I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. But it is so weird that we did this this processing, you know, to to achieve it. And man, I have no idea. So I kind of can't wait to get it. But then there's this other part of me that's like, oh yeah, because you saw my recording studio here. Yeah. It's not like I have anywhere to look to it. <laughs> you're just gonna have to do like, like you're just gonna, gonna pull it out, box, sniff it, you know, make sure it's the right weight. <laughs> just like, all right, it's good. It's good. <laughs> Looks great. Looks great. No, no scratches. It. No scratch. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> I'm pretty much yeah. gonna call somebody like Marco. Marco, do you have a turntable down there, or are you just yeah to set up? Yeah. It? Okay, so that's the way it's gonna go. The day it comes in, I'm gonna drive to LA go and, listen. or Altadena, wherever the hell you are, and we're going to sit and listen to this thing. All right. I am so curious. I mean, I hope. I hope it. I hope we did justice to it, you know? We'll yeah. See. Well, I can't wait to hear it too. Um, Marco, I, I did read somewhere that, or hear somewhere that you identified early on as a bassist and then made this, the transition, as they say these days, into a guitarist. Uh, that was <laughs> <laughs> And a woman. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yeah. My, 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 I, used, I, I used the pronoun bassist and guitar player. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not making light of that. But uh, you're really killing it tonight. I, yeah. I gotta go. I gotta go take a piss. I'll be All right. right back. Yeah. Do okay. Think. Good. So let's talk about Joe. Okay. So this yeah. guy Joey. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. Well, I um, I I, but, I had Jay Bentley yes, on but, the show <laughs> real quick, Marco. Before he comes back, I had Jay Bentley on the show. Yeah. He said when he was uh filling in for Fat in uh me first in the Gimme Gimmies. That he was told early on, just make make sure you give Joey a bunch of shit and you'll be just fine. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. That's very <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, but like, uh, I mean, the funny thing is, well, Derek, who's a big part of the Bad Astronaut story because he was the drummer, right? And he was the original drummer of Lagwagon. The guy who Derek Plord, who's who's no longer with us. Mm-hmm. He, the, he and I, like, we both had different reasons to form Bad Astronaut. Like with Joey, it was kind of like dude, we haven't been in lag wagon together for a couple years and I miss you. And this is kind of going to be our way to break bread and kind of get back together musically. Right. Yeah. And then for, for Derek and I, we had grown up in the same neighborhood. Like literally we were like the same little kids, like going to heavy metal concerts and then getting into punk rock. Cause we got into skateboarding and then going to punk shows and then forming a band. And like, I taught him how to, I was the, I sort of play guitar when I was a kid like I maybe got a year or two jump on it than from all my other friends that started playing music. Mm-hmm. So I taught Derek how to play bass so he could be the bass player in my little neighborhood punk band that I had called Illiterate back then. Illiterate. I right? love it. I love and those so old punk all, band like, names like that we all had when we were in garages and shit. Yeah, totally. And like <laughs> we were literally like little kids in a neighborhood just pl- practicing after school. And then Derek was just that guy. Like I like to tell the story. He was just that guy that got really good at everything he tried, mm-hmm. you know? And so he would like, you know, one day you're showing him how to play bass. The next day he's like better than you at guitar already. And then like <laughs> a week later he was better at the, than at the drums than the drummer. And you're like, fuck this guy. He's like a musical, like just, you know? And so he became so good at drums that he, we eventually reshuffled the band and, and I switched from guitar to bass Mm. and Derek switched from bass to drums and this, the, you know, anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but we hadn't played together in a while. We actually played together for a minute in this band, the, the, the Ataris when they first started, Derek yeah. was the drummer on the first Ataris record. And w- the singer of the Ataris moved to Santa Barbara and I started playing bass with them. We actually toured, I think we might've opened for Lagwagon for a while. Um, and, um, but then that was pretty much it. 
And then we were kind of, so, so like, yeah, so we both had this experience where like Joey and Derek hadn't played together in a while. Me and Derek hadn't played together for a while. Joey and I had act, been friends forever, but we had never actually played music together. Marco, stop talking. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I was, so, I like, love yeah. meeting everyone's dogs. This is part of, this is my fun part of the podcast. So for some reason, everybody I talk to, every once in a while, they'll just like pull up this little dog and like, uh, Joey, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, you're not the first person to do this, but what, what is, what is I that know. dog and what is his name or her name? This is my dog, Mochi. She is a gremlin. <laughs> um, Mochi. She also is a bat and she's a dog and she's, and it should, you know, just so people aren't confused, she is the best dog in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my my dog is in the other like main part of the house, so I'm You're not going to bring in studio, not gonna bring but in. like but I can show you like a little picture of Kiki if you can just see. There's Kiki. Oh, There's my little dog. That's Kiki. That's cute. Cute. Yeah. Cute. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, she's a lot of work. Um, so, uh, yeah. So that was all I mean, you that's guys the thing together. about yeah. there's something about bad astronaut that was like this. It was this like you know, was, hey dude, I miss playing with you. I miss playing with you. I miss hanging out with you. And then all of us realizing like this is just fun. Let's just do it. A big part of the story too. I started on guitar. I switched to bass, and then I played bass for years and years and years. And then like I when Circle started in 1999, and that was like oh well they already had a bass player, but me and the singer really like hit it off. And so he was like, well dude, why don't you just play guitar with me? And, um, and I was like, okay, you know, it was like really like no thought process. It was just kind of the same playful spirit as bad astronauts. Just like, that sounds like fun. Sure. Let's do it. That's and then it was like, you know, kind of figuring out how to play guitar again. Cause I had never really dove too deeply into guitar other than just using it as a songwriting tool. And like, just, you know, everyone has like an acoustic guitar leaning against their wall, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> but I was never like a guy with a pedal board making guitar parts. And I, yeah, I don't yeah. know. So then it was like. I don't know. I'm just a fucking identity crisis. I don't know if I'm a guitar player or a bass player or like a fucking, you know, I don't know what I am. I just play music. Like musician. I just like music. Yeah. Know? There you are. Yeah. Music, music, music weirdo. There yeah. You go. Um, yeah. so yeah, I also saw somewhere your, uh, your, the last, uh, concert you went to was kiss at the Staples center before the lockdown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you guys, you guys, you guys just love music. Yeah, both of you guys just love music in general, and you could tell, you could tell in the, in the bad astronaut stuff, um, it, it's very eclectic. You're kind of just letting it run wherever. We've already covered how that how that process goes down, but you know the the age old thing though. It seems like you're all the way from mellow uh, coffee shop music to to hardcore metal in in some respects. Um, can you talk yeah. to me a little about some of your sure, favorite yeah, sure. favorite artists and everything like that? You know, not necessarily the typical influence who influenced you and everything like that. No, I'm talking about like what's some what's some of your favorite music that uh, maybe I haven't checked out and maybe some of my listeners haven't that they should go check out. Oof. I've been listening to. Um, oh, my God. Like, like currently or like when we started just whenever, astronaut. just whenever, like what, what, like what yeah. are some of your favorite acts I, of all I, time, I, you know? I think it's, I think the band's called Frightened Rabbit. You know this band? Something no. like that. Frightened Rabbit. I'm so lame. I can't believe how sad. And um, Typhoon, I've been listening to a lot lately. Okay. They're great. Um, but I think they've already broke. No, no, no. The, it's the other one. Frightened Rabbit or whatever. They made like five records real quick and then the songwriter like killed himself or something. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, it's really sad. But, uh, the name wrong that's the worst like dude i'm really into this band called heinous <laughs> priest <laughs> metal band from the 80s. I, I, I i'm not familiar with that one yeah <laughs> i mean like i you know it's sad i'm gonna remember like right after we get up yeah um, i you know i mean i listen to things people give me you know mm-hmm. and it's all across the board and it's always been that way i don't I've never really been so partial, except for when I was in my teens, I think there was a period where it was like, if it wasn't metal, I didn't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I had grown up listening to everything from ABBA to Zappa. So I was destined to like a lot of things. 
Yeah. Um, and my parents always listened to a lot of folk and my dad listened to a lot of classical music and the Beatles were always on in my house. So I, I, I never really had any kind of idea, only maybe a few years where it just had to be metal. And then yeah. punk, I, I don't think I ever felt that way about punk. I That's love interesting. punk rock, but I, but I never felt like it's got to be punk, like a lot of guys I know did mm-hmm. and still are. Um, like Fat I Mike, just, I was yeah. when you hang out with Fat Mike, you ask him if he's heard like any of these oh, anything God. else outside of the punk rock world. Yeah. He's never listened to anything no. else. No, <laughs> no, and try being in a cover band with him. Like me and Mike used to pick the songs the Gimme's would record. Yeah, and Mike was Mike was like we had to set up a system, and the system was Mike gets veto, you know. And mm-hmm. I like that system because I like song the songs he writes, you know, and. And so we would, you know, select a bunch of songs and it would mostly be me because I guess I was maybe the kind of music historian in the band. Like I just always listened to everything basically most of my life. And so I would come, okay, here's the genre. And I would come with like 200 songs <laughs> and Mike could be like astounding every time astounding me just going, never heard this song. Yeah. It's like, that's what he was telling me. Never man. It's heard insane. Amazing grace. <laughs> 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 How is this even possible? <laughs> You're from America, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, just every time, like an Elvis song or something, you go, I don't know this song. It's not a good song. And I'd yeah. be like, oh, dude. Help me. But Mike you know, is so but funny, it dude. For the so funny, really dude. Yeah. I mean, he's a punk guy. He's super yeah. punk guy. Yeah. I just, I don't really I, care. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really, I think. I think it's generational too. Like Mike's definitely like, you know, like he, you know, punk, punk was such a, such a closed circuit when it started. It was something that, like, you know, if you were like, no effects yeah. got a really early start, you know, they were doing it from when they were teenagers yeah. and touring. I remember, you know, so I feel like they just, it's like know. almost like a, it's like a lifestyle. It's almost like a religion or something, you know, where they're just like, this is my mission in life to just spread it, punk rock. It and, depends. It depends on a lot uh, of things though, because the, you know, I'm older than Mike and I listened to punk back in the seventies and the early eighties and I was into it. And there were a lot of my super punk friends, like people like Matt Davis or something, mm-hmm. you know, right. like people you knew, they, they, they were like, it was, they were only punk and they only did punk things, but they'd be like, yeah, that first Iron Maiden record, that's cool. Yeah. And it would be like, Right, it is Killers. fucking cool. Yeah, and then the I knew a lot of punks like Black Sabbath is great. You know, they I don't think punks were necessarily narrow minded. They grew up on stuff in the seventies before they got into punk and the sixties. Yeah. So, you know, they they all had a brush with you know the deep purples of the world, and they, I think there's just there was an element of people that there are always those people, but. I don't get them because music is like this yeah. amazing thing. Why would I'm just such a like, I love food. I love design. I love yeah, what if you only alcohol. Like- I love music. You know, I just like I love a variety of things. And it just seems like if you only listen to one style of music, it's like, all right, what's for dinner tonight? Pizza. What's for dinner tomorrow night? Pizza. Mm-hmm. What's for dinner? What was it for dinner last night? Pizza. What's for breakfast? Pizza. You know, you're just like, fuck, dude, I love pizza, but like too much of it, it stops being special. Yeah. Like I want to check also, out a variety of shit. I- I've made the argument for years. If you only listen to one kind of music, you don't like music. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I agree. I, yeah. I truly believe that. Like, I think if you're a real lover of music, it can't be only one genre of music because that just doesn't make any sense. I, well, it's interesting that you say that, Joey. Because, like, when you were saying how, like, the one time in your life that you were very like that you had like sort of like a you know tunnel vision about music was when you were maybe a, a kid and you were really into metal. And I was the for same like, way. Like for like one year, my right. year of life, maybe my 14th year, there were like two years, but it's because you're presenting your teenage years, you know, right. And you're looking for, you're searching for your identity and you're looking for your tribe and you and kind you of have to things. have a tribe. You have to pick yeah. a tribe in high school. It's survival. Yeah. It's fucking survival. Like you got to find your tribe. But I mean, you know, even when I was just like Motley Crue, fucking rat, you know, guns and roses, you know, it was all about that. It was like, I still would like my sister would be playing Madonna and I'd be like, God, that's a fucking great song. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to tell my friends that. No. But I, I, I got my car. My Is car, it closet Madonna? Yeah, I was like Madonna's 
fucking awesome. And yeah. I kind of want to have sex with her. Yeah. But, like while I'm listening to Motley Crue, you know, but like, um, you know, and then you like, but I would hear the Beatles and I would be like, mm. like as a kid, I, I heard it when I was little, but then when I heard it as a teenager, I was like, this sounds like music for children. This doesn't sound like rock and roll to me. It doesn't sound like it's just not heavy enough. And then it's like, couple years into it when you become when you start making up songs and you start playing music and then you then you go back and listen to some of that shit and you're like holy fucking shit the oh, Beatles yeah. are incredible yeah. you know I like, like came a lot back of around I agree with that but not with the Beatles yeah I liked it from the very beginning like I liked it when I was a kid and I, but I, I didn't like it when I was a teenager at all I, was I like, actually oh, didn't I, either I understand why and I totally had that with like the Carpenters so I can relate yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's like, I, I think that is kind of tribal. Like we were like, all right, I'm a meddler. Okay. Now I'm a punker. And then eventually, you know, I feel like, like maybe when you get to be about 17, you know, I, I started getting really into classic. Like when I started learning how to play guitar, I started, you know, you get into classic rock a little bit because yeah. you just start to like read interviews with the bands you like. And like the guy in Motley Cruz telling you he likes Motha Hoople and David Bowie and the guy in Metallica Peter is telling Green. you he likes you know, the shit he likes and then, and you sort of self educate and then you go, okay, I guess it's cool to like weird different shit. And then you explore it and you realize that it's actually really dope. And, um, and you expand your horizons, you know? And then yeah. I think like Joey and I have this in common where we never stopped. We never like hardened our music taste and just went, this is what we like. Like a lot of guys at this, in our stage of life are just like calcified. They're like not open for new music. They're like, fuck it. The shit I like is the shit I like. And that's just what's up. And, Sorry, don't play me Phoebe Bridgers. I don't want to hear it. And I'm like, dude, bring on the new shit. I want to hear new shit all the time. Doesn't yeah. mean I, I'm not going to also listen to old shit, <laughs> but I just love music. Like Joey said, it's like love music. You love yeah. music. And it's like, there's so much to check out. Why would you, why wouldn't you explore it? You know? Totally agree. Couldn't agree with either yeah. of you guys more than on that, uh, on that aspect. I mean, a love for music, um, you know, you, you also have different emotions and I don't necessarily want to hear yeah. Metallica when I'm, when I'm feeling down, you know, it's not, it's not, yeah. <laughs> not what I'm going to do, but other times totally. I want to listen to Metallica, you know, I, I go through oh, phases yeah. too. Like there's times where I was like super like into Elliot Smith and like, you know, then it just wanting to hear like kind of introspective singer songwriter music. Then there's times where I'm like, I got really into electronic music where I want to hear like just, just psychotic fucking, you know, like things like flume, and like, um, you know, like, uh, uh, shit that's on like, uh, what's that weird British label warp records and stuff like mm. that, where it's just really weird. And it's like, I, I love, uh, I've gone through like a reggae phase where I want to listen to like really fucking trippy old reggae. It's it's, 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 it's very right. cy- cyclical, like with alcohol, like you go through a whiskey phase and you go through a fucking bourbon phase then you go through a, yeah, each and every day, phase. each and every day I go through yeah. a, a different <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I literally was about to say, hey, I don't know how much longer we're doing this, but my whiskey phase is about to start. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Marco, that's a really, those are good points. I yeah. actually, uh, you know, I, I, I'm with Johnny on the mood thing, too, though. I mean, it's like you have different emotions. And I love putting on, like, jazz in the morning because it just makes me happy. Yeah. It, it's like I love, like stuff that moves and it's kind of like, and I don't want to hear a vocalist sometimes. Yeah. You know? I just want to hear like a, a little jazz three piece band, like that kind of stuff. You know, it's so cool. Like Miles Davis, even, you know, yeah. amazing, super wacky. Um, but it's just, there's a time and a mood for everything. And then there's some times where I'm just like, nah, fuck everything. I want to hear ride the lightning right now. Yeah. Right. And I want to hear it. Four times in a row. Yeah. <laughs> the whole record. You sound like my like, son. He, yeah, that's, that's that's how my son listens to me. It's four times in a row. <laughs> Everything. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Awesome. I know. I, all kids, man. It's like, except it's one song. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's oh one song God. over and over. <laughs> Baby Shark. Oh, yeah. You guys miss yeah. Baby Shark. You lucky sons of bitches. You guys didn't have to hear that fucking song. <laughs> over right. <laughs> yeah, I got lucky. Violets. The one that I really remember that Violet had to listen to over and over again was like that went on a, a long enough time that I still remember was about when she was three, mm-hmm. maybe four, and it was the song "Bonzo Goes to Bitburg" by the Ramones. Oh, it's a great song. Which oh, is yeah. my favorite Ramones song. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it came out, I was like, "Ooh, they're changing," you know. But now I'm like, you know, the hindsight. Yeah, I'm like, oh no, it's like the best song. Ever. It's so great. We listened to that. 
over and over and over and over for months and months and months. And I, yeah, I got so lucky. Yeah. But there were phases where the really weird, you know, kind of stuff was going on. You're driving the car and you're just going. (laughs) (laughs) Again, tonight, again. So last thing I got to talk to you guys about is uh, the Badass or Not Linoleum cover. Because uh, it, we, we were just with uh, the NoFX guys for their linoleum revamp, and they did a little thing when we were in the studio and came by oh, yeah. and everything. Oh, that's right. You guys, yeah. Yeah, we did that. Uh, that was rad, by the way. It was, it, it was a great song. It was fun. I mean, I didn't do shit on it. I just got to be in the music video. It, it was just our guitar players that played, like, some noodling stuff over their song. But uh, I loved your guys' cover of Linoleum. Um, with the banjo and everything going on in it, and then how it how it continually builds and uh, you know, I think everyone should go check this out. And this is probably how many years ago was that that you guys did that? Yeah, but that is was, it even like that was a while ago? Not even out. I don't think I've ever. No, heard it's on. It's on YouTube. I mean, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's like officially in the world. world. I I did. There was an original version that I did. Just. I recorded the song because I, I, you know, I always liked the song and I recorded it. And then I think I had a banjo with Tom and honestly, like that was not meant to be like a bad astronaut thing at all. Like I had just done a cover of it because I think I was thinking about like putting it on an acoustic record. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I told Mike, obviously, I was like, Hey man, I'm going to do linoleum. And then, for some reason, it kind of morphed into a bad astronaut thing. Yeah, I remember tracking it at Orangewood. Yeah, I playing, oh, playing but it. I brought it in with vocals and guitar. Mm. It was like done. Yeah, and yeah. then we just put everything else on it. But it really worked much better as a bad astronaut. Like it was cool with that beat. Yeah, you know, yeah. like so, like groovy beat. Um, I mean, it's a great song. Yeah, we did it. We we had that kind of a, a through line with bad astronaut. Now that I think about it, we did. It was kind of part of the tradition. Um, to do covers. We did like 500 Miles on Acrophobe, which is like an old folk song, right? And yeah, we did yeah. um, Needle in the Hay by Elliot Smith. We did, we covered a um, Armchair Martian song, right? Mm-hmm. Was, we did uh, a whole, rec- we did a half a record of that. Right, we did, but then we put one of the songs on um, on Houston. And then we did uh, Soul yeah, yeah. Sister by the Posies, which is a great band, a great like kind of power pop band from Seattle, and from Megan. Washington. We did Megan by the Smoking Popes. We did, and then what else? And then yeah, Linoleum, uh, No Effects. Do we do any other covers? I can't remember. You got them all. Yeah, I think. yeah. But that was kind of an interesting. That's what we should have done, dude. We should have done a fucking another cover for this thing. Should have been a cover, man. Right. Let's put Got out another man. box set. We'll do that. Yeah, the next one. Way better than original. Band, dude. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, when you retire, it's not even weird when you start doing the state, you know, the state fair circuit. You know. <laughs> All right, you know, we're gonna cover an Avenged Seven. We're gonna we're gonna do a badass drum version of an Avenged Sevenfold song. I would love it. <laughs> oh yeah, like that's gonna be interesting. That would be all, hilarious. I like, love it. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> pretty rad. How the fuck do I do Just make sure you please incorporate some banjo in it. If you're going to do a Vincent full properly, it's got to have some banjo in it. I mean, Dude. in my opinion, anybody ever does a Vince seven full with banjo, it's going to have to be like really upbeat, like bluegrass. Like it's gonna have to- <laughs> Dude, yeah. now you know what we got to do? We'll call John it's Popper. Ripping. We'll get John yeah. Popper to play harmonica. Do the Vince seven full guitar solo with harmonica. That <laughs> I actually think that somebody could do a bluegrass like New Orleans style record <laughs> of Avenged Sevenfold covers and it would be awesome. I really that hope to hear that bad. one day. I really truly hope that to hear that one day. <laughs> fucking thing ever. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't I, I don't think it, 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 as a guitar player I should say I don't think I have the chops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 so it would neither do I. Neither do I. <laughs> it would take every member of Bad Astronaut, and, and granted, there's like six members of Bad Astronaut. We'd all have to have our hands on the fretboard together at the same time right. to be able to approximate like what one guy in a bench seven full could fucking do. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you totally missed the third note. It was your note, not arpeggio. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Come on. Oh, that's god. fantastic. Oh. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. It was an awesome, absolute awesome chat for me. Thanks for having us. And one thing I want to mention, that, that I, I think thank the you. pre-orders for the box set might be already sold out, but 
One thing that came out of this, which is really cool, is each record is going to be available on vinyl, like a la carte. So you can, if you didn't get the box set, the limited edition box set, you can still get okay, these cool. records on vinyl, at least for a little while. So jump on it. But yeah, just so you guys awesome. know if you're listening. And you care. Yeah. yeah, very Thanks, cool. Yeah, Johnny, thanks for having me. Thank you guys very much for being on. Fun. Yeah, it was fun. Next time we uh, got to do it in person when uh, when we could do that. Yeah, exactly. Time it so it's after May 3rd so I can drink with you guys. Okay. <laughs> Not, uh, yeah, easily. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Dude, thanks again, Matt. Okay.